There was reason for people to be hopeful about the EU project. The fact that you could travel in Europe without passports from country to country was interesting. There was a while when there seemed to be a real sheen on the EU project. And there was, of course, concerns after the First and Second World Wars that the project of nationalism had flaws built into it, especially on the European side that were so massive that some other um, form of government might reasonably be attempted. The world is unifying more too because we communicate with each other much more. What are the true implications of the European Union and how has the concept of nationalism evolved over time? In this compelling interview, Jordan Peterson dives into the historical and political complexities surrounding the EU, nationalism, and the consequences of global governance. Peterson then reflects on the broader global context, emphasizing the importance of democracy and national sovereignty. He points out that democracy allows for the peaceful resolution of conflicts through voting, unlike authoritarian systems. Throughout the interview, Peterson and Nigel Farage underscore the need for a deeper understanding of history, democracy, and the dangers of centralized power. They call for a return to fundamental democratic values and a cautious approach to global governance. Distributing power farther up the hierarchy to a unified, say, European government or the UN or the WEF for that matter, had serious flaws. So what do you think it was that made you alert to that so much before anyone else really cottoned on to it? Well, I'm a sort of amateur historian. I love history, and I do think there are things we can learn from history. Sadly, we rarely do, but there are things we can learn. And, 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 and here's the point. I mean, yes, of course. You know, in 1870, the Germans invade France. In 1914, the Germans invade France. In 1940, the Germans invade France. And so this, 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 this idea came around that if you unify France and Germany, and of course it began with a coal and steel pact in 1951, if you unify France and Germany, if you unify the whole of Europe, those nationalistic factors that caused war would go away and we could live in peace. And I completely understand why people would have thought that after two catastrophic wars, all the awful things that did take place. But it was based on a fundamental misunderstanding. And the misunderstanding was that the existence of nation states led to war, but they made one fundamental error. And it's this, provided the nation state is acting as a functioning democracy, you don't have that problem. There is no example, there is no example in history of functioning one functioning democracy going to war with another. And far from being a project of peace, I took the opposite view. I took the view in, in, in about 1990, really, I took the view that if you take away from nation states their ability to determine their own future and hand it up to a higher authority over which you have little or no say, Far from dampening nationalistic fervour, it's likely to increase nationalistic fervour. And here's the thing why democracy works. Democracy works because whether you like the result or not, you settle it with a cross on a piece of paper, you know, and not with a gun. And so I actually felt that it was likely to provoke nationalistic groups not <clears throat> to diminish them. So I took that big picture view a long time ago. Uh, and, and, and what happened was, I mean, you see, we did have a referendum on this back in the 70s. And my parents were told, look, vote to stay part of this because it's about trading with our neighbours. It's going to be good for business. It means we can travel to Europe freely. Ironically, pre-1914, we could travel all over Europe without even having a passport. That's been rather forgotten. Um, and, and, and no one thought, or very few people thought back in the 70s, that it would threaten sovereignty, that it would threaten nation state democracy. And, 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 and as the years went by, a project that started around peace became a project about power. Tony Blair himself said, this is now a project of power. And the ambition of the European Union was, was actually to become the world's leading superpower. Miles away 
from what we told we were joining. Now, look, I, you know, I've worked for American companies in a previous life. I even worked for a French company for a brief period of time. I get it. We're living in an interconnected world. I understand that. I am generally pro-free trade, provided it's fair. Um, you know, and I get international business and travel. And, you know, I understand all of these things. But the unit by which we want to live, our ability to determine many things that are very important in our lives, democracy, which for goodness sake is what, is what we fought two world wars for, these things really, really matter. And to begin with, you know, my warnings about this were thought to be hysterical. Uh, but in the end, it did become a majority view. And I think if you look around Europe now, you'll see political movements that are on the rise who, who really are talking about similar things, Jordan, to what I was saying 10, 20, 30 years ago. I'm absolutely jaw-droppingly amazed that the Conservatives adopted net zero policies under Boris Johnson. It's like, what the hell were they thinking? You know, my the most skeptical part of my brain, and I suppose the rude part, thinks that this was cooked up by Boris Johnson to impress his young wife now on the personal side. And that the Conservatives as well, as a group, lacked a vision so comprehensively that they had to turn to this idiot climate apocalypse mongering that's used by power-mad tyrants to cow the public into delivering them all the authority and power. And so I just can't wrap my head around the conservative shift to net zero. Not, not only because it's such a profoundly anti-conservative movement, at least with regards to such things as entrepreneurial activity and freedom, um, and it's, it's profoundly anti-subsidiary, so uh, it works against the spirit of distributed responsibility. And the economics of a shift to net zero are so appallingly catastrophic that it's a miracle that anybody who could count would even ever consider it. So like, what the hell was going on with the, and certainly this is part of the reason they're being devastated at the moment. What in the world was going on with the conservatives? Where were their heads at? If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and share your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to subscribe and click the notification bell so you never miss out on our latest content.